Welcome back to the Thinking Critical Comic Book Podcast. It's time for our next lesson in comic book writing 101. And today we're going to talk about incorporating humor, writing jokes for your comic book. And I have two wonderful creators. If you've read Mark and Tim Lim's uh, My Hero Magadamia, it was a wonderful satire piece, uh, really funny. And if you've read Aaron Sparrow's Darkwing Duck, absolutely hilarious comic book. So we have the two perfect writers to talk about this subject today. I'm very excited. We're going to go through a variety of topics, and we're going to let uh, you know Aaron and Mark kind of freestyle at the end and talk about how they've incorporated Hero in some of their bigger works. Obviously, here with me to talk about this is the writer of Common America, My Hero Macadamia, USA GI, Mark Pellegrini. How you doing? Happy to be here again. Well, I'm glad you could make it. Also, we do have the man behind Darkwing Duck, Aaron Sparrow, one of the funnier comic book writers you're going to find. How you doing, Aaron? I'm doing fantastic. All right, so let's get her started. We'll get right into it. You know, we'll just start with some basic information, just types of jokes. You know, you have observational jokes, anecdotal jokes, situational jokes, character jokes, like the joke is the character himself. You know, you can have one-liners, really effective with a character like Batman, where he's so serious all the time, he throws in out a little funny one-liner, and it really works for the character. You can have ir irony, uh, farcical jokes, self-deprecating, slapstick, running gags. Mark, what is your favorite type of humor and jokes to incorporate into a comic book, and why is it that, that they work effectively in comics? Well, so my favorite kind of joke, and the important thing is that you can't just do the same joke over and over again or it won't be funny. So even if it's your favorite, you've got to spread it out with different types of humor. But my favorite that I like to use is I call it the Tex Avery gag. So Tex Avery cart MGM, they always had this this one joke where there's a character who walks in and out of the cartoon and you don't know what their deal is. They just kind of interrupt the cartoon and walk across the screen and they'll do it four or five times. Like the, uh, the Thanksgiving one with the Jimmy Durante Turkey being hunted by the pilgrim. There's this bear with a, uh, eat at Joe's sandwich board on walks in and out of the cartoon and everybody stops and looks at him in the cartoon. And then at the very end of the cartoon, you find out what his deal is, but, and that's the payoff to that joke. It, I loved those kinds of jokes. They're always in Tex Avery cartoons. So I like to put them in some of my comics. Um, um, uh, my Hero Macadamia Volume 2, uh, Walmite Volume 2, has that joke with uh, with Brett Kavanaugh. So the, the Walmite books are a political satire for people who haven't read them. Um, and we have this running joke with Brett Kavanaugh where he's in the, the comic and he's not doing anything. And periodically the characters will remind you that he exists. And then he has that payoff at the end. You find out what his deal is. Um, and even though it's not a comedy book, uh, Black Hops, Volume 2, Hair Trigger, uh, we did a similar thing with this character named Rigor Tortoise, this turtle that's uh, plodding along the, uh, the bottom panel of every page. And then you find out what his deal is at the very last uh, page of the book. And that's the payoff. And I love jokes like that. All right, so we do have a super chat from Darth Bobcat, and we will also be taking uh, questions later on, but Darth Bobcat has to say, as we all know, the best comics humor revolves around politics, food, cats, and memes from two years ago. Aaron Sparrow, <laughs> truer words have never been spoken, sir. Yeah, we called that the Gail Simone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I have to agree with Mark. I, I really love the uh, the text every type gag where, uh, you know, you, you're like, what is, what is the meaning of this? Uh, we started to do that in Darkwing. We didn't get a really a, a chance to, to really pay it off the way that we wanted to. But uh, there's an episode of Darkwing uh, from the cartoon show where uh, Bushroot has this henchman who's like a big, big walking plant, kind of like a big walking Venus flytrap named Spike. And uh, Darkwing ends up playing fetch with him throughout the episode to get rid of him. You know, he discovers that he picks something up like a stick and, you know, throws it. Spike will go chase it. So uh, we had a moment in, uh, in the comic where Darkwing is at the mercy of a villain. And you don't know how he's going to get out of it. And then all of a sudden there's this rumbling and Spike comes crashing out of the bushes and tramples the villain. And he's holding, he's, you know, he's holding, like he drops the, he drops the fetch item wanting to play with Darkwing. And, uh, you know, the joke is that like every, periodically Spike just shows up at opportune times. <laughs> <laughs> still wanting to play fetch, you know, or Darkwing throws the throws the stick or the bone or whatever it is, and Spike runs off after it. You you won't you won't see him for a few issues, and then later he'll just show up. And uh, we wanted <laughs> to keep that kind of kind of going. So uh, yeah, I love that type of joke. So Aaron, one of the things I you know I mentioned earlier is the character joke. The character himself is the joke. You know, <laughs> uh, maybe he's so over the top, or he's just gratingly annoying. Maybe he's 
you know, extremely sexist or something like that. And he shows up and he adds a bit of comedy and then he leaves, essentially. Yeah. The problem with the, with a character like that, and I think they're really effective, is if, if the character becomes too popular, you start incorporating them too much. And you just try and play them off as the joke. If you have a character like that that becomes popular, you're going to have to expand the character and make him more two or three dimensional, right? Yeah, you're going to have to give the character more depth. Anybody who's going to take up a, you know, any kind of uh, presence, you know, they're not just there for a quick, you know, in and out gag. Uh, anybody who's going to be a main focus needs to have some kind of depth. They need to, you know, we, you need to reveal something more about their character and make them compelling. And, and that's where you kind of get into, okay, well, why is this character the way that they are? Uh, if you watch the first couple seasons of Archer, um, he starts out, you know, in, in those early episodes, just very much the sexist, misogynistic kind of secret agent, you know, like a, a, an exaggeration of, of James Bond in, in every negative way. And then throughout the series, they start slowly revealing to you that, uh, you know, there's all these reasons from his childhood, you know, every his upbringing, you know, the, the way that his mother treated him, that he is the way that he is. And he actually becomes more of a sympathetic character as the show goes on. He's still still boorish. And, uh, you know, still has a lot of flaws, but you identify with him more and you actually care about him and you want to see him do better. Yeah, so the, you have to have some character growth. The, the character, if he's just going to be a joke, he has to be used sparingly. If you, if you decided that you incorporate him more, you're going to have to expand the character. Exactly. Now, let's get into to, to some of the benefits of uh, actually using humor since we've gone through, you know, some of the types of jokes and a couple of examples. So there are a lot of benefits, actually, to using humor. You can add levity to situations. If you have a really dark uh, comic book, really dark moment, a joke is going to ease some of the tension and make it you know, a little bit easier to read. You need some levity in some of these really dark books. You can also satire real-life events. There are certain things you can't really talk about without maybe offending people or uh, you know, getting too serious. You can do it satirically in a comic book, and that can be really effective. You can also use it for character development. As Mark or, or I'm sorry, as Aaron was just saying, kind of adding some background. Why are they this way? You know, and and kind of show the the who the character is. You can also identify relationships that way. If you have two characters that are really busting each other's balls, that's certainly an indication that these two are good friends. Maybe they've all known each other for a long time, and you can build relationships that way. You can also make a character much more likable. People like funny people. If if you can crack a joke. You know, with your coworkers, they're going to enjoy your presence anymore, and that's going to go with your readers too. If you have a nice, funny character, they're going to like it more. If you so, if you need to make a character more likable, you can throw a little funny side into them, to where maybe they have some self-deprecating humor, or or maybe a one-liner here or there. But the most important thing is that it will entertain readers, and I think that's probably the biggest benefit of humor. Uh, Aaron, when you've been writing, obviously you've done a lot of humor. What is the biggest benefit that you found in using humor in your comic books? I think the biggest benefit for me is that people find it entertaining. You know, you want to connect with your audience. You want them to like the work and you want them to come, you know, at least I, at least I do. I know this isn't popular in the industry right now necessarily, but I, when you read something that I've done, I want you to come away with a good feeling about it. I want you to walk away and say, wow, that was, you know, that was a lot of fun and I can't wait for the next one. So that's the main benefit, I think, is that you give people something that brings them joy, that puts a smile on their face. You know, there's so many things out there right now that uh, that are, you know, just by either, uh, you know, design or or just by, uh, you know, the nature of, of the way that the world is uh, to drag you down. And I think people look to entertainment for escapism. And so if you can make them laugh and, and give them a good time, I, there's there's great value in that. And one of the things that I really love about doing a humor book and doing a, uh, a character that, uh, that resonates with people and, and trying to keep that character consistent with what they expect is that I've had people at conventions come up to me and say, you know, just like, tear, like get tears in their eyes and say like, I, you know, I was going through a really rough time in my life and this book was kind of the only thing that I had that was like my escape. And there's something so gratifying about that, that some work that you did brought light to somebody's life in a, in a dark time. You know, we really forget the impact that, these things can have on people when we're sitting, you know, in front of our computers at, at 2 a.m., you know, <laughs> literally uh, typing out our script. Uh, you know, the, these things matter. These characters matter. They have great value to people and, and people, uh, people have invested in them. And, and I think it's a responsibility to, you know, to live up to that. So I think that's the greatest benefit for me as a, as a writer. As far as the story, uh, storytelling goes, it's just like you said, it adds levity. 
you can, uh, you know, inject some humor into serious situations to kind of like lighten the mood. I think there's a danger, you know, you have to know where to sprinkle it in. There's a danger of undercutting your, oh, yeah. your story if you, uh, or, or the seriousness of the moment. If you, you know, after every serious moment you put in a joke, it works in a film like guardians of the galaxy because the characters are largely ridiculous. Uh, I don't think it worked as well in say Thor Ragnarok. Uh, although uh, yeah. yeah, Chris Hemsworth is, is naturally comedic and he's really, really good, but there's, t- you know, that is a, a story where his three best friends are killed. He never even finds out about it. His entire home that he's lived in his entire, you know, 1500 years is going to be destroyed and everything is undercut with a joke. And it just really makes none of the stakes matter. I, that ticks me off. And it's one of the, it's the biggest danger of humor. I call it, so I call it jingling the car keys. Um, and I associate it with the entire uh, body of work by Joss Whedon, because he does that all the time. And I, I despise it. Humor is important, but you also have to know when it's appropriate and when you need to get serious and, and maintain the uh, the tone of a scene. And with something like uh, uh, movies and TV shows, what he does is if he has a sad moment, you know, a moment that's going to make the audience he'll throw in a one-liner or a gag or something and the audience is like oh it's all a joke what you do with a baby when you see a baby is about to cry you hold out your car keys and you jingle your car keys at it and the baby stops crying forgets what upset it and goes ha 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 and giggles and claps and that's what these movies do they're these marvel so many marvel movies now uh and horror movies too which also ticks me off um it chapter two was like that where like you gotta a scary scene. There's a lot of tension building up. Everything's leading to something, and then someone slips on a banana peel, and there's a, there's a fart sound, and ha 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 ha. The audience claps and and laughs and giggles, and you know that's just the director jingling the car keys at the audience. Like, oh, the audience was about to feel an emotion, but laugh, and then they they put in a joke, and that gets obnoxious, and uh, it your story to your characters. You need to know when it's okay to make the audience cry. It's okay to scare the audience, not to make the audience laugh. You just have to, you know, know that there's a time and place for certain things and to have a joke attached to it. Um, and that can be so, the hardest thing, yeah. So Mark, we're, we're, we're gonna get into the pitfalls of, of humor and some of the things to look out here for in a second. You've done a lot of satire, and I think comic books in, in a satirical comic book really allows you to cover things you just really wouldn't be able to cover in a serious comic book because it would be too taboo. How have you used the, the ability to use satire in a comic book to really get a point, uh, a message, or, or convey your thoughts? Well, um, so Tim and I did uh, the Walmite trilogy, which was a, a series of uh, political satire comics. And politics in general, are they, they are what govern our lives and have on on us uh, economically, socially. Uh, so those are things that politics should be, t- which is why it's difficult to talk about them, you know, with any, uh, with, without getting into fights with people, unless you're of humor. And uh, even then it still pisses people off. So like the, our Walmart books off a lot of people because like, you're not allowed to uh, make, jokes about this or that uh, only we're allowed to make jokes about this or that so i mean you're gonna get into a fight you're gonna loot and you're gonna get into a fight either way but it, it helps broach certain subjects there was a subject in the third walmite book which was uh, uh the Magalorian, and it does have a subtext about um pro-life and pro-choice and that's one of the the topics of that book which is a very, very serious subject, um, hard to broach with people. So we we made it the core of, of the narrative, but it's a comedy. So we put a lot of humor into this conflict between two ideologies and two sides, pro-choice. And some people reading the book might not even picked up on that. Um, it was maybe a bit more a, a bit more allegorical, so they could read it on different levels. They can interpret it the way that they wanted, or the way that um, it came. I mean, it's a bit of a balancing act, uh, but it is a way of being able to talk about certain things that you know you would never touch in a dramatic book. Yeah, it would just be too serious, and people don't like to, to touch it. But if you do it with satire, 
it's a lot easier. So well, you were getting in. Oh, I'm sorry, Aaron. Yeah, there's a book that uh, uh, that was out years ago um, that I really I really enjoyed. It was really dark humor. It really you know pushed the envelope as far as uh, things that you were allowed to talk about. It was called Arsenic Lullaby, and uh, one of the main characters was a uh, a voodoo. Uh, a guy who had been cursed with a voodoo mask. And so uh, his name was Voodoo Joe. And he wanted to raise a zombie army, but his apartment was too small to have a bunch of zombies in it. So he went to the dumpster behind an abortion clinic and he raised a bunch of fetus zombies. And it was this running gag in the book and it was so dark and it was so like, just a for such a horrific subject, but somehow he had managed to make it funny in this really disgusting way. And it was, it was just, kind of really, you know, there was a lot of subtext to it about like, you know, why do you, why do you think this is horrible? You know, people who are writing in and, and saying like, this is so horrible and, and of, uh, of poor taste. And he, and he would get into debates online. I'd see every now and then where he would be like, well, you know, what's your, what's your stance on this issue? Why do you find it? You know, why do you find this reprehensible that I'm doing this if you support this? Um, and it was just, it was really interesting to see like the, the takes that he would have on things, um, a book that could never exist today in our, our current climate. But, you know, it spurred conversation. And I think that that's the situation that we're in right now is that people don't want conversation. People want to shut it down. So, you know, they come after humor books because, of course, humor is a good way for us to have those kinds of conversations. Stimulates conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get to the pitfalls. You were getting into it a little bit uh, earlier, Mark. Let's talk about some of the pitfalls of humor. These are just some of the things that were off the top of my head. You can undermine your protagonist. If you make him the butt of the jokes and you make him look like a, a complete imbecile, unless that is the point of the main character, and there are certainly heroes that are imbeciles that are basically you know, following through the story and accidentally you know, succeeding. But if you have a serious character and you don't want him to look like an idiot, you're probably not, not going to want to make him the butt of the actual jokes. Uh, if you use over overuse certain types of jokes, or if you overuse a joke in particular, it will become grating over time, and it won't be be funny anymore. So you have to take your your shots when you when they make the most sense. Uh, satire can also be taken seriously. Not everyone is going to read what you're doing as satire. They might read it as you know a, a serious you know point about something. So you you could hit someone could interpret things the wrong way. Uh, like I did mention earlier, gags can become old very quickly. If your joke takes a long time to execute, you could end up wasting pages upon pages trying to get to a punchline that really has nothing to do with your story. And the last pitfall is you might not be a funny writer. <laughs> and, and if you're not funny... That scares, yeah. And that, that's the thing that scares me. Is, and when you're, when you're writing jokes, so if your book is specifically a comedy, then you're you are required to write jokes. You can't, it's not a comedy if you don't write jokes. Making a book that's supposed to be funny, then you gotta be funny. And doing those Walmart comics, you know, where it's like joke, 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 joke. Uh, I was like, oh, is this actually funny? And it was a good thing that I was collaborating with Tim because he could tell me like, no, Mark, that's not funny. I'm like, oh, okay, well, good. Then don't put that in there. And that would help me edit. Um, but it's almost a relief uh, doing books like Common America and uh, Black Ops USAGI because uh, they have humor in them, but they aren't ostensibly comedies the way Walmart was. So I have the choice not to be funny if I don't want to be. Like scenes, I can play for drama. I can play them off for horror. I can play them off for action. I don't always have to play everything off for comedy. So a load off my shoulders. It's like that old saying, dying is easy. Comedy is hard. And yeah, joke after joke, you know, you always second guess yourself. Like, is this funny? And you can tell. Um, and a lot of these uh, comics aren't funny, but they feel obligated to include a joke in a scene. And I, I'm trying to think of a specific example, but it, it's in a lot of these these books, like Hellcats, like uh, Jason Aaron's uh, female Thor run, stuff like that, where they make these really awful jokes. And, and it's like, 1970s Hanna-Barbera tier comedy where it's like, I've heard of blank, but this is ridiculous. You know, something like that. Like, that's not funny. You knew that wasn't funny when you wrote it. Why did you put that in the book? You had, if you, if you had the option not to be funny, to play a scene straight, then don't. Yeah. Uh, but so many writers, they, I think they're just trained by the, the Marvel movies, the MCU type movies. 
everything's got to be funny. Jingle the car keys, Joss Whedon it, you know, that they feel like they have to include a joke and they, they don't realize that you don't have to. If it doesn't fit the scene or if you can't think of anything funny at the moment or if it's if it's just not a moment in that scene, then, uh, and not enough writers realize that nowadays. So, Aaron, you are a funny guy and you, you've written funny comic books. Is it hard for you to turn it off, you know, to, to edit out maybe some of the jokes that maybe you want to include? Yeah, it definitely is. I mean, sometimes, you know, you want to have a serious moment, even in a, even in a book like Darkwing Duck. You know, that's a, a book that has a lot of heart, uh, you know, and the heart of the show is the love that he has for his adopted daughter. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's serious father-daughter moments that you want to, you know, you want to have in the book. Uh, and you're always tempted to like, okay, well, this is, is going to be funny enough because people are here because it's a comedy. You know, do I need to insert something here or can I just let the scene breathe? Uh, so, you know, we've got one moment in, uh, it, it's kind of the kind of the same moment, but with different characters. So they go, in one issue, they go to a comic book convention and uh, Goslin runs off because she's going to be part of the, of the cosplay contest. And, if, you know, when you get to the end of the book, there's a moment where Goslin appears and she's in a Darkwing Duck outfit. And Darkwing is, is kind of surprised. He's like, you, you dressed up as me? And she's like, well, of course I did, Dad. You're, you're my hero. And there's like a really warm moment. You know, he hugs her uh, because up until that point, they were kind of having a little bit of a conflict and he was feeling really undervalued because even his sidekick Launchpad was dressed up as Gizmo Duck, who he can't stand. <laughs> so, you know, there's a nice warm moment between them and they're, and they're hugging and we let that beat rest for a moment. And then Goslin immediately admits that she's done something that he won't like, you know, where, where she says that, uh, oh, by the way, I kept one of uh, Bushroot's, uh, you know, plant raptors and it's, uh, it's nesting in a box of your sweater vests. And he's like, Shh, just, just, you can ruin the moment later. Um, <laughs> and then later we do, you know, kind of the same thing where we have a moment between her and Launchpad where they kind of connect and we don't do a joke afterwards because in that moment it didn't fit. You know, we, we had set up a conflict and then we had to pay it off. But to do a joke there, it would have undercut it. Whereas with Darkwing, it was funny. With Launchpad, it would have ruined the moment. So you kind of have to know where you're, uh, you know, you got to pick pick your battles. So, yeah, it's a tough call sometimes because, you know, when you're doing something humorous, you want to you lean into it. and uh, But you can't do it all the time because you also want your story to have weight and, and your characters to have some gravitas. So, Aaron, and, uh, J.P. Rocha brings up something uh that I think is worth talking about. He says, Bendis humor is the worst. And I think the reason Bendis' humor doesn't work is because no matter what character he's using, it's the same joke. It's not written from the point of view or from like the personality of the character that he's writing. And I think if you're going to incorpor incorporate the humor, it needs to accentuate the character and highlight their personality. I completely agree. It's... It's one of those things, you know, when you're working with a, a good cast of characters that are different, they're going to have different perspectives and you're going to be able to make jokes out of that. It's the difference between writing yourself, which is something that narcissists do, and writing characters, which is what writers do. So, you know, you really have to lean into the characters and find the humor within them. Because, you know, if you think about your group of friends, not everybody has the exact same sense of humor. Not everybody has the same personality. But sometimes your friends can be really funny coming from, you know, their point of view. And they can really kind of take you off guard with a, a joke that they'll make. And, and that's the way that you have to view characters. You can't just go into a story. I've said this many times on your channel, but you know, you can't say to yourself, oh, I'm writing Fantastic Four now. How can I write my stories with the Fantastic Four? You have to ask yourself, what type of good Fantastic Four stories can I tell? And then lean into the characters and do it that way. And that works the same way for humor. So I think a great example for people who, who want to say like, well, what, what do you mean when, you know, a different character has a different type of humor, a different style of humor than another one. And that's the problem right now, as Wes mentioned, is that like every character in like Tony Stark, I remember watching Doctor Strange and, you know, Benedict Cumberbatch, his style of humor is different than Junior's, but all the jokes he was making, it was like they were written for Robert Downey Jr. Uh, same thing, Guardians of the Galaxy. Everyone's this condescending, snarky, quick, and it's all the same flavor of character in all these different Marvel movies. I think if you want a good example of how to write different characters with different types of humor, um, I really recommend reading um, Roger Langridge's Muppets comic, which uh, Aaron edited, uh, or just watching a Muppet movie or, or the Muppet show or something, because every Muppet 
has a different style of humor, uh, the kinds of jokes that they make. And that's why they work so well as an ensemble cast. Kermit the Frog, his style of humor is that he's just like absolutely exasperated with the antics of uh, the Muppet crew. And so his jokes are very observational um, and, and quippy about uh, the other characters. Uh, Fozzie, he has uh, self-esteem uh, issues. So all of his jokes are self-deprecating and about his nervousness and his stage fright and whether he thinks he's funny or not. Um, and Miss Piggy, I think uh, Frank Oz described Miss Piggy as being um, a trucker that thinks uh, model. And so Miss Piggy's jokes are all very um, conceited and, and very cool. And then she loses her, her temper a lot, even though she thinks that she's, you know, a dainty little flower. And all the characters have a different style of humor and they play off of each other differently. And it doesn't get old. They're not like they're always making the same kinds of jokes. It's just that uh, the humor that's tailored to them is unique. Uh, Kermit doesn't make the same kinds of jokes as Miss Piggy. Miss Piggy doesn't make the same kinds of jokes as Fozzie. And that's what makes them all feel so distinct. And what makes the Muppets funny is that they each have their own uh, little box that they're in. Uh, whereas, you know, if uh, you watch like an MCU movie, everybody's the same. Everybody's just trying to do Robert Downey Jr. Whether it's Paul Rudd, whether it's Benedict Cumberbatch, whether it's uh, uh, Chris Evans, they're all just doing the same character and it's all boring. <laughs> well, I'll say, uh, I will say that uh, Paul Rudd gets gets by on pure charm. That man is yes. a special treasure and I will not hear any disparagement of him. <laughs> <laughs> he deserves better than to be in those movies. <laughs> uh, you know, I actually enjoy the MC movie, MCU movies, but you're absolutely right. There, there came a point where they realized, man, Robert Downey Jr. is so good at this. What if we made everybody Robert Downey Jr.? Then the film would be more <laughs> successful. And so they give everybody kind of that, yeah, they do give them that that kind of like... Guardians of the attitude. Galaxy is when the humor in the MCU just died. It all became the same jokes. It's all third grade humor. Yeah. It's the lowest common denominator. I think uh, that the greatest example of, of that, of diminishing returns on that, is when they tried to give Robert Downey Jr. style lines to Brie Larson, who is completely incapable of uh, delivering them. <laughs> that's just not her, that's just not her style. Like, I, I mean, I think that she can be funny with the right material. Like, I think she was, she, I think she was funny in Scott Pilgrim, not in a ha ha, you know, she's telling jokes kind of way, but she had a very 21 Jump character. Street, she was yeah. funny. And she played it very, you know, she played it very well. So I think that, you know, again, you know, just much like with your characters, you have to know the strengths of your actors. It's the same thing with, you know, whether you're writing for an actor or you're writing for a character on the page. You've got to know who that character is, what they, you know, what they're bringing to the table, and you have to extrapolate from there. Absolutely. So those are some of the pitfalls. Obviously, we could, we could go on that for like, that's probably an hour subject just on its own, but. <laughs> You know, we wanted to get into some writing humor tips that, that we have. These are just some of the ones I have. And I'm not a humorous man, so hopefully Mark and Aaron are going to have some um, some better tips or maybe you can extrapolate on these. But you want to be strategic. Humor should add to the story. It shouldn't be there just for its own sake. You should be accentuating a character or a plot line or creating some levity to let, let your, your uh, readers breathe. You also you need to use it sparingly unless it's a comedic comp, a comic book itself. You, know, you need to pick and choose your battles uh, wisely. Uh, you, know, you got to stay focused on your story. You don't want to undermine your story or your characters with the punchline. You, you, you know, that shouldn't be the main focus of what you're doing. Uh, also, brief is always better. Get to the point with your jokes. They shouldn't last for two or three pages. Uh, let your readers know it's actually okay to laugh now, even though this might be a serious subject. We just throw a joke in there. The readers need to know that's okay. Also, <laughs> if you can, you should probably incorporate real-life situations. People are going to be able to relate to that. If, if something funny is happening and you've got a moment that it fits in with your story, it's probably a good time to incorporate some of that humor that you've, you've had. And this is something I would absolutely avoid at all costs, unless you're just the greatest comedic comic book writer ever. I would avoid sarcasm. People <laughs> cannot read that. You need a tone of the voice and you know the facial expressions to really pick up on that or like deadpan that kind of works with batman sometimes but it's normally in the in the case of like one-liners but if, if the joke needs a voice or facial expressions changing for it to be conveyed you need to kind of avoid it in comic books so there was some way about music 
like don't put music in your comics because people can't read the beat that goes with the lyrics so it just all sounds like bad poetry sorry unless, you're, do, unless you're doing it like the old uh craft the movie uh stories that they would do where it would say you know things like you know, it would tell you what what song to listen to at this part and then it would tell you <laughs> panel. you know this this takes place in the arctic so to simulate the cold please read this next these next few panels standing in front of an open refrigerator <laughs> you know they would, they would do things like that um so but again that's a, you know a good use of uh, clever use of comedy uh, one of the, you know, you, you said, Wes, that, uh, you know, you have to really pick and choose, especially with a character like Batman. And it made me think of uh, the Justice League Unlimited pitch that I did with Ly uh, Lionel Castellani and, uh, and that James Silvani was, uh, was involved in as well. Uh, we had a moment where I wrote a full spec script. People have only seen the first five pages, but I, I wrote a full script for it uh, because it was just so much fun. I, I just wanted to finish it. And there's a moment where Nightshade is trying to use the Dark Force to reach into there's like a temporal shield uh like a time shield and she's trying to reach in and get this item out of it without you know triggering any of the the traps that have been set up and batman makes his entrance while she's trying to do this and he just said his entrance line is don't touch the sides and it's just a, you know it's a reference to operation it's it's and we had a huge debate over whether or not that worked because it was batman and batman does not generally crack jokes he might have a one-liner here and there but, you know, that's not his character. And uh, we actually shot it all the way up to, uh, to Paul Dini, <laughs> who, uh, who read, <laughs> read the script. And, and that was the one thing I was most concerned about. And he goes, no, he goes, I think that in the context that you've got it, it works because he's making an entrance and he's kind of, you know, uh, <laughs> he's basically kind of setting the tone for, you know, the fact that he's going to, uh, he's going to take her out. He's going to stop her. Uh, so he goes, I, I, I actually like the line. I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Dini, like Paul Dini, I think uh, he's one of the, writers that I admire most and who I would like, if I could ever write even a 10th as good as him, then, you know, I, I, I'd be very satisfied and on my deathbed, but there's an issue of um, his run on detective comics. Um, and I think it's the one that everybody remembers from his run on detective uh, cults. And it's the issue where the Joker um, ties Robin up to the seat of the car and he's just driving around Gotham, killing people for the entire issue. And Robin can't do anything about it. And it's, it's a terrifying situation and it's not the the balance of it is so amazing i really recommend people read that issue just if they want to figure out how to balance with horror like that issue is like a textbook example because the situation is we're dying and somehow it's still funny and scary at the same time there's a part where the joker pulls up to um, the drive-thru of like a McDonald's and makes his order. And um, he gets his order and it's wrong. So he goes back and like Robin's just tied to the chair, the, the passenger seat the whole time. And he's like, I ordered a uh, large no cheese on my hamburger. And like, I'm sorry, sir. Like, let me speak to your manager. And so the manager comes out and like, how may I help you, sir? And the Joker just shoots him and then drives away. And it's, it's violent and it's awful, but it was so funny the way that, uh, Paul Dini wrote it, and it didn't undercut the uh, the situation. Uh, and it one, it's a great comic; people should read it. His entire run on uh, on Detective was fantastic, uh, but that specific issue is a great example for people to go and check out. And that's accentuating the character of Joker using him, because mm -hmm. it highlights just how maniacal he is, and you know he does want to be a be a comedian at some point. It's leaning, kind of into, rare. Yeah, it's leaning into the it's leaning into the character with the comedy. Yeah. Right? It, it's kind of rare to actually have funny Joker stories. Like people who aren't good at writing comedy will write a Joker story. And so they'll give him, you know, like whoopee and, and yo yo's and things like that. I think they even uh make a reference to that in uh Batman Beyond Return of the Joker when uh, Terry's facing the Joker down. He actually points out that he's not funny. He's like, Come on, like rubber chickens and fake dog vomit. Like, where's the A material? And Joker's getting really pissed off because, you know, it, that is a point where people, like, Joker's most of the time, he's, he's not funny. He's making jokes and the jokes are funny to him, but he himself is not funny. It's actually kind of rare to have a Joker story that's genuinely comedic. Um, and a lot of Paul Dini's Joker stories have a lot of great humor in it, but that's because Paul Dini's a good humorist. Yeah, there's uh, there's the moment in uh, Batman: Mask of the Phantasm where you first meet the Joker and they go into like the, the house of the future and he's doing he's doing a bit he's doing a whole bit and it's it's amusing but it's not like you know drop dead funny uh, but it's obviously funny to him he's having a good time 
and that makes you kind of like it is because you know it's he goes in he's talking about this you know this robot that's you know chopping uh you know chopping food it's supposed to be you know it's for oh you know look at old hazel here you know she's uh you know we've we've still got the electricity you know all the stupid puns and things like that but it just works because of of you know the the fact that that's the joker's character and you know is if he's enjoying himself then then we might as well go along for the ride so, Aaron, do you have any other writing tips or just something that you use that just uh, helps you effectively incorporate humor into a comic book story? I don't know if I can really quantify this because the biggest influence on the way that I write Darkwing uh, and the way that I write, um, you know, I'm working on a creator-owned book and kind of the way that I'm approaching that one because it's also a humor book. Uh, it's, it's very satirical. But I tend to follow less uh you know people say like you know oh you know you must darkwing duck must be like your number one influence for for doing darkwing duck and it is as far as the story and the characters because obviously i'm drawing from what's come before but the greatest influence on the way that i write humor in a comic is sam and max by uh, steve purcell and that is a book that literally has a joke in every panel where if it's not visual it's in the dialogue and, uh, and so it just keeps that book really moving along at a great pace. Steve Purcell has this great ability for it not to become tiresome because the two characters are so much fun and they play off of each other so well. So I always look at that as kind of like the model with, you know, with Darkwing and Launchpad. Can we get it, you know, if there's not something visual, can we get a, a joke in there in the dialogue because of, you know, who these two characters are and the way that they bounce off of each other? Uh, so that's probably like the, you know, I, I definitely recommend that uh, people... I don't know if they're in print anymore. Dark Horse did one a while ago. And every now and then uh, when San Diego Comic-Con's going on, you can catch up with Steve Purcell and he'll have some uh, some trades to sell. But definitely seek out the Sam and Max books if you want to see a, a way to really, uh, you know, pump up, pump up the humor of characters. Mark, do you have any other writing tips, you know, kind of just besides the stuff that we've talked about already? Well, I mean, we talk about dialogue and that it's more of a general recommendation for writing dialogue is characters to sound like they're talking to each other and not at each other. And a lot of um, comic writers realize that dialogue needs to sound like a rapport. It needs to have a rhythm to it. Um, and sometimes that can get lost in the editing process. If you have um, an intrusive editor who goes in and, and adds their own material into your scripts, you know, and you don't find out until you, you read the book on the printed page, like, I didn't write that. Um, it screws up the rhythm of the back and forth that the characters have. It screws up their patter. Uh, so when you're writing your, your dialogue, uh, always consider reading it back to yourself. Does this sound like they're actually having a conversation or are they talking at each other? And that goes for humor as well. A lot of, uh, a lot of times jokes don't land because it doesn't sound like the characters are actually having a, a back and forth. That they, they're not having a, you know, a tete-a-tete. -tete. Uh, and that's, I know, that's, that's where I'm going with that is to dialogue flows. Um, that's why Bendis is never funny, because his dialogue doesn't flow. It's just a huge wall of text of people talking at each other. I think that just diagnosis-wise, that's why Bendis isn't funny. Um, but whereas Paul Dini, um, I keep bringing him up just because now um, I got a, his style of writing in my head, is that his characters always talk really well with each other. And as, as Aaron pointed out, that there's charm to it. Sometimes the humor isn't just a laugh out loud, gut busting joke. Sometimes it's just the charm of the way the characters interact or the way they um, react to a situation. Um, that's just because it's scripted really well. Uh, that's all. All right, so let's get into some, um, some anecdotes. Let's have some stories about incorporating humor. We'll go to you, Mark, first, My Hero Magadamia. You talked about this earlier. This is the funniest gag that I've read in a comic in a very long time. I, just recently, there's been this gag in Hellions from Zeb Wells, and I think Hellions is actually a really good comic book. But there's this stupid gag with Mr. Sinister's cape. cape. And it's stupid. It's superfluous. It adds nothing to the story, and it's just not funny, and I hate it. Every time that cape comes up, I want to throw the book because it's just not funny. But you have a running gag in My Hero uh, Magadamia. I think it's the second volume with Brett Kavanaugh. Certainly a very serious subject. You know, with his uh, his confirmation hearing, all kinds of uh, you know news on either side. People were wanting to kill each other. It was crazy. So you went in there. You know, uh, My Hero Magadamia is it's a political satire, and you kind of. Use Brett Kavanaugh as a, an enormous punchline, and I imagine it probably pissed off people on both sides. But essentially, he's sitting there drinking beer, getting drunk the entire time, and every once in a while, he just shows up. 
And he's like, you need me yet? And then Walmite's like, no, no, we don't need you yet, Brett. Keep drinking. And we get this a, a few times, and he's working like a, a, a vest that looks like Stone Cold Steve Austin. <laughs> and then finally, they're like, all right, you're up, Brett. And he's all drunk, and he's like, he's like Stone Cold Steve Austin. He's this enormous wrestler, and it turns out he's, a, he's the biggest badass in the whole comic book. But it was hilarious because I love Stone Cold. I, you know, it was addressing the farcical nature of the outrage that was going on at the time. Some people took it really seriously. I thought it was a bit over the top. And it, you know, it was once we finally got to the punchline, it felt like I was laughing out my loud. My wife thought something was wrong with me. I was like, you're not going to get the joke because you don't watch wrestling, but this is hilarious. <laughs> well, that, that was one of those Tex Avery style gags that I really wanted to do that I, I'm really fond of. And I, I wish I could do it more, but like I, I said, you don't want to do the same gag over and over again, or it won't be funny. You've got to you've got to use um, types of jokes strategically. And a good example, I think, of uh, of that is it's from The Simpsons, but it's when Mo is talking about his history as one of the original Little Rascals, and he's like, "Yeah, my gag was uh, sticking my my eyeball up to the exhaust uh, pipe of a car and getting a face full of soot." Yeah, it was really hard coming up with. In every short, but we had good writers back then, and you know, you think of a character who's just got like a one-note joke thing over and over again, and maybe it was funny the first two or three times, but by you know the thirtieth time, it's just like, all right, you know, learn learn a new tune. You know, I, I was I have one of those uh, Disney treasures sets of all of the Pluto car, and you watch like the very first Pluto solo cartoon. And he gets some um, flypaper stuck on him. And so he spends like five minutes trying to get the flypaper off. And it's it's a lot of really good animation, a lot of really good cartooning and expressions. And it was considered at the time to be like one of the, you know, most influential uh, bits of animation just because of the character acting within it. But then he does that in every single short. Pluto gets like a crab will will latch onto him or a starfish will get stuck to him or a cactus will get stuck to him. And then he spends five minutes and it's less funny each time they do it. Um, and that's the that's the thing with uh, the Tex Avery gag. As much as I love them, you know, I've only done it twice in all the comics I've written because I know that if I keep doing it over and over again, it won't be. Um, but yeah, with Walmite, we, you, you mentioned that like, oh, we, we probably pissed off people on both. Most people, uh, regardless of what side they were on, thought it was funny because believe it or not, people can take jokes or the expense of, um, their political spectrum, as long as the joke is funny or as long as that person has a sense of humor. But then we also had people who just absolutely, you know, reaction-wise couldn't stand it. Um, the Transformers wiki in particular was so incensed at um, the, like, Thump, the first hundred days, uh, that parody book where, where Trump is a rabbit that we did. They're, the Transformers wiki people were so incensed about it that they've just filled up um, Tim's article with nothing but uh, accusations of him being a white nationalist and him being this and that and pointing to all these uh, hit piece articles at like Vulture and Vice.com and, and Vox and all, uh, all these, uh, you know, Salon.com and places like it on, on our books as, you know, as source references to prove that Tim's a white nationalist and there was something <laughs> Filipino Chinese, by the way. Um, but yeah, so there are people who just have no sense of humor, couldn't get the joke, and you're not going to please them regardless of, of what you do. So you just got to just gotta be prepared for that. Uh, you're going to write jokes, and some people are going to get it. Some people aren't. Um, doesn't necessarily mean your joke is bad all the time. It just means that there are people out there who have no sense of humor. All right, Joe brings up a good one. I know you love The Simpsons, uh, Aaron. Do you want to talk about this? Well, you know, first of all, I want to talk about Joe. I saw him on one of your, uh, I saw him on one of your streams recently, and I had it on in the background, so I, I was looking at him, and I thought to myself, does Wes have Jeff Goldblum on? His his voice. There's so, certain moments where his voice sounds so much like Goldblum. I came back in and I was like, oh, that's Joe Carallo. Oh my god, like he could uh, he could make a good living as a Jeff Goldblum impersonator. <laughs> he's Absolutely, just got, he's just fantastic. It's just a he, he gets a real Jeff Goldblum and Adam Carolla, and then Perch gets uh, Kurt Loder. <laughs> no, Joe's, Kurt? Joe's definitely got a charming voice. Uh, so you know, yeah, Joe, I could just I could listen to your uh, your dulcet tones, uh, you know, for hours. Uh, okay, so what he says here: Simpsons early on had some great running gags. The one where someone comes up with an excuse to leave, walks away, then you hear them running, then slam the car door and speed away was a great one. Yeah, actually, I, I still reference that all the time in uh, 
just with uh, with people in my real life where uh, they'll say like, okay, I'll, I'll be right back. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> then I'm just going to hear the car door slam and the tire street. Uh, there, so there, yeah, there were a, a bunch of a uh, bunch of good jokes like that, and you can, but yeah, yeah, but they were smart to kind of space them out to where they didn't they didn't become tiresome. Uh, I'll give you an example of a joke that I liked, but but that became less funny when they would reference it again. Uh, there was a joke on Family Guy where Peter hits his knee, and he sits oh. there for an inordinate amount of time, like holding his knee and just like ah, ooh, and. Okay, so I've I've had knee injuries before, and and so like I related to that because it's like when you just hit your knee, and it just seems like the pain goes on forever. But the joke, you kind of laugh because he hurt his knee, and then the joke goes on, and he's still there, and it becomes very unfunny. But they knew to hold it long enough to where you're like, is this still going on? And it starts to become funny again because you're like, I can't believe that they're still doing this, and so you laugh again. And then when they did the, uh, the one of the Star Wars specials, they have one of the adats, you know, when it gets tripped, it does the same thing where it holds its knee and it goes, you know, ah. And I was like, oh, they're referencing the thing that was funny the first time. But, you know, it wasn't <laughs> funny there. It, was, it wasn't funny. It was just a reference. And so and the, the Peter and the chicken fighting yeah. got old. Yeah. Well, so Family Guy has this problem and they... The joke is that it when you have oh, I'm, I'm trying to find my words here because this is something that that ticks me off. If the joke is that the joke isn't funny, don't do it because that's never a good idea. And Family Guy will do that frequently, like with the Conway Twitty cutaways that last like five minutes, you know. And they keep that one episode where they did that like four times, like at least fifteen minutes worth of content. In that episode is just Conway Twitty clips, and like the jokes that the joke's not funny, guys. Like then it's not funny then I'm not laughing, then it's not entertaining. It's just annoying. Playing a prank on the audience, like, ha, ah, you came here for humor, but we're just going to play the fucking dancing in the streets of the entire music video for like eight minutes. Like the joke's that the joke's not funny. I'm like, that's awful. Self in a situation <laughs> where you want to put something in your script for like the joke's that the joke's not funny, stop. Just stand up, walk away, take, take a breather and come back and don't do that. <laughs> And then sometimes they'll do they'll do the type of joke that I really enjoy, which is uh, they had a moment where Brian and Stewie are having a conversation in the bar and the dad from the comic strip Family Circus comes walking up and starts offering his opinion. And Brian just loses it on him and says, you know what, uh, you know what, uh, Family Circus dad, I'm so tired of you and your self-righteous advice. And he says, why don't you go F your wife right in the effing face? I mean, they, you know, they bleep it out. Uh, yeah. And then there's a, there's a beat and the Family Circus dad goes, you know what, Brian? I think I'll go do just that. And then like 20 <laughs> minutes of the episode goes by and it comes in on Peter reading the newspaper. And all he says is he just kind of like sits back, like he's taken aback and he goes, well, this is a fairly shocking family circus. <laughs> and it's like, okay, see, that's a good payoff. You know, because at the first you were like, this is a weird moment. Like, you know, you know, I get it that you're picking on the family circus dad because that's a terrible strip and it's just always there at the bottom of the newspaper just waiting to suck. And so it's like, okay, so you just hate it as much as I do, but then it had a good payoff. So, you know, with Family Guy, it's a real it's a real mixed bag. Sometimes they nail it and sometimes they don't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, so... you can also you can also be tempted to uh, uh you sometimes you come up with a really funny joke. And it just doesn't fit the scene. And you don't want to cut it because it's funny. And that can be the hardest thing is that, and that's something Tim has to edit me on is that I'll come up with a joke and I think it's really funny. And Tim will tell me this joke is really funny, Mark, but this scene needs to be played for drama. And I understand in a way I can sympathize with the, the Joss Wee gun style where it's just like jokes, jokes, jokes all the time. It's like, they're funny, but you can't be a joke all the time. But the, here's the thing that if you have to cut a joke uh, because it doesn't fit the scene, save it for later. I mean, the audience isn't going to be reading your first draft script. They're never going to know that you cut a joke. You can always use it later, maybe in a different context, in a different scene, in a different situation. So don't don't feel too bad about cutting a joke that you think is funny because it doesn't fit. You can always just like save it for later and use it another day. All right, so we, we, we've getting, got some uh, stories there. Let's go over to Darkwing Duck. So, Aaron, this one's interesting because Darkwing, he's not a spoof, but he's almost a parody of a superhero in many ways. So he's not a joke character, but he's supposed to be funny. Uh, yeah, and the, uh, the humor of Darkwing, you know, he is an effective superhero once he gets over his own ego. 
you know, and that's kind of the the recurring theme of the book is he's he's wildly insecure. He, he's fairly competent when he needs to be, but he's wildly insecure. And that plays into the humor of his character a lot. He's he's filled with bravado. He wants recognition. You know, he wants people to think that he's great. He wants to be the greatest superhero in the world. And he his, he gets in his own way constantly. And it isn't until he kind of like learns the lesson of the episode or, or you know, comes to that realization that, you know, it's time to get it's time to get knuckle down and get serious. And, you know, and then that's usually where the phrase let's get dangerous comes in. And then, you know, you get to the uh, you get to the confrontation where he actually uh, is able to hold his own. But up until then, he's he's kind of a glory seeking buffoon and that will cause him problems. And that will be, you know, a lot of the conflict that he runs into. So he's humorous in that respect. And then, you know, he's paired off with Launchpad, who uh, is a, uh, you know, people always remember Launchpad crashing planes. Uh, he did that way more in DuckTales than he did on Darkwing. In Darkwing, he was a fairly competent pilot because that's what the story needed him to be. And a lot of the humor came more from he was uh, he was a little bit dumber than uh, than he was on DuckTales. So, you know, those two characters play off of each other. But, you know, Dar but Launchpad is also very heroic in his own right. And, uh, you know, they, they both have a good moral center. And so that's what makes them good superheroes. But the comedy comes from their human failings. You know, Launchpad's, uh, Launchpad's kind of stupidity and, and obliviousness and Darkwing's, uh, Darkwing's ego and, uh, you know, his need for recognition. So <clears throat> are there any, you know, uh, stories, you know, writing Darkwing Duck, you know, wh whether it's working maybe with Silvati, like how hard is it to really integrate the writing of the, of the jokes with incorporating it into the art itself when you're executing it on both levels? Well, I will, uh, you know, so there's there's visual gags that I'll write for for James. And, you know, one of the things uh, working with James that's, that's so gratifying is that that guy, he's got a great sense of humor himself. And, uh, you know, he when we've gone on, we've been on panels together or, you know, even even like kind of our Twitter back and forth, we're both very self-deprecating uh, and we play off of each other very well. And that, I think that translates to the page. So I'll give James a some visual gags and he will sell them to the moon or he'll come back to me and he'll say, Hey, in this moment where you've got like these, uh, you know, the characters talking and it's really funny. He goes, but I could do this visually too, you know, where I add this to it. So he, he will add to the joke. That's actually why I hired him was he filled in on a, a Muppet series for me and ended up drawing the rest of the, uh, the rest of the book. Um, we had some scheduling problems and uh, the artist that we started out with uh, Dave Alvarez wasn't able to hit the schedule. Um, because of not through no fault of his own, but just through the uh, through the nature of the business and the way that uh, that Boom kind of uh, haphazardly handled uh, you know putting books to market. But um, I, I saw James work in uh, in one of our forums, and I said, "Hey, I need you to fill in on an issue to get it back on schedule and he, uh, on a Muppets book." And he was like, "Okay." And I sent him the script, and he had the full twenty two pages back to me in two weeks. He just like knuckled down, just like knocked the whole thing out. But when I got it, I was blown away at how he sold each joke and how everything that the writers had put in, he just enhanced with the visuals and, and the expressions of the characters. And, and, uh, and so I hired him to do the rest of that book. And then when we went to Darkwing, when you know, it was decided that Darkwing was going to be a, uh, a series, there was nobody else that I wanted to work with. I was like, this is our guy. So I think that it's, it's one of those things that, you know, it's it, and lightning in a bottle, much like, you know, Mark and Tim work so well together. Uh, you know, it, it's tough to imagine Tim working off of somebody else's script. I mean, I've seen him do it a few times and he does a great job, but there's just something ma magical about when those two come together. <laughs> Thank you. No, it definitely feels like it's missing something. When uh, when you get a Tim's art, you you know, on a more serious book. So I don't know. I guess that's the antidote part. So we're on to, to viewer questions. If you have questions, let us know. Um, is there anything else that either one of you wanted to to reiterate or hit before we we start answering questions and winding this down? No, I think um, we we've hit uh, everything on the syllabus and really the uh, the important things. Oh, um, I guess there is one thing I did want to bring up. So, comedy relief characters, uh, they are one of the biggest dangers, I think, and you need to be aware that you can have a character, levity and humor. Um, but the temptation with comedy relief characters is to make them useless because we're all used to the ones from cartoons. We think of Slimer and Orko, um, characters like that who are just there to, to prat fall and do slapstick and get in the way and screw everything up. Um, that pleases no one. The audience doesn't like 
fully exists just to mess everything up and uh, ruin a moment with comedy. Um, you can have a comedy, but they don't have to be useless. They don't have to be a nuisance. Um, it's, it's not uh, a law that your comedy relief character has to be annoying and worthless. I think a great example of a comedy relief character who actually contributes um, in, to the dynamic of the team would be Avatar The Last Airbender has Sokka, who's the comedy relief character. He's there to provide jokes and quips and be funny, but he's not useless. Uh, he's, he serves a very important function in the team, even though he's the one who doesn't have any bending powers, uh, but he ultimately the one who kills like the bad guy in the third season, the combustion man, and he does it with his own skill. Uh, but he's really funny. Sokka sometimes is people's favorite character in that show because he's the comedy relief character, but he's not useless. So that's just something that I think people need to keep in mind. If You can have a comedy relief character, but they don't have to be Zack the Fifth Turtle from Ninja Turtles. It doesn't. There's no law saying that your comedy relief character has to be worthless. <laughs> there's... Uh... There's, in the, uh, the comic convention issue of Darkwing Duck, we, we paired Darkwing off with Honker. We wanted to, we wanted to emphasize because Honker's always there in the periphery, and you know he's usually there for, for tech support or uh, you know he's that type of character. But he's also the, kind of the, the little bookish nerd who, who does not want to be on these adventures, and that's kind of the joke of his character. So it is really tempting to make him kind of a useless character. Uh, but in issue six, we were like, you know, well, we really want to, we really want Honker to step up. And so we paired him off with Darkwing, and Darkwing does not want to tag along with him. You know, he doesn't really relate to him. He's a muddled foot. And, uh, you know, even though Darkwing has general positive feelings towards Honker, he's still a muddled foot. And, you know, <laughs> this, this family that, uh, you know, that, that Darkwing can't stand, these annoying neighbors. Um, so we, pair, we, you know, we, we send them off on this little adventure together. And at the end, it's Honker who saves the day, you know, through his own, uh, you know, through his own knowledge and uh you know he's not a hero he does not want to be involved in the action but he but he has to step up and uh and it was a lot of fun and people uh people really responded to it they said you know wow it was really nice to see uh see honker get a moment to shine and not just be the comic relief so yeah i, I definitely agree with mark on that aaron did you have any other one last point or something you wanted to emphasize before we start uh winding down yeah i think this this applies to writing comedy but it all just apply it also just applies to life in general is constantly evaluate yourself just try to have some self-awareness and know if you're funny uh you know there's there's so many writers working today that think that they're hilarious and and they're not i think that where chip zadarsky came into his own as a, as a writer uh, at marvel is you know they kind of were putting him on books and they were like oh he's the funny guy because you know his twitter's funny and he seems like kind of just a generally kind of uh kind of amusing guy to be around i've, I've talked to him in a few shows and he is very entertaining you know he's he's, he's amusing in, in person but it wasn't translating to the page. They were giving him, you know, characters like Spider-Man, and he was writing kind of these goofy moments, like Spider-Man showing up for a date in his costume in a blazer, you know, with just a blazer over the Spider-Man suit. And it was like, I, I see what you're going for, but it's not working. It's not funny. And people were kind of lambasting him for it. And to his credit, I think he took the criticism to heart. And he said, well, you know, this isn't working. What, what else can I contribute instead of being the funny guy? And he actually became a guy who writes really, really strong character-driven stories. Uh, you know, his run on Spider-Man ended up being really good, like the interplay between him and J. Jonah Jameson. He gave Jonah a lot more depth and, and wrote some really good stories there. And, and his run on Daredevil is one that I'm really enjoying. So, you know, just kind of, uh, you know, kind of evaluate yourself and be willing to take criticism. Not all criticism is an attack. You can, you can actually grow from it and become a better creator. All right, so here's the first viewer question. This is from Marigo, and this has definitely got uh, Aaron Sparrow written all over it. Uh, have we talked about putting Looney Tunes style jokes uh, within this conversation, specifically Alan Grant's Lobo Run? What do you think about Looney Tunes style jokes? Oh, I absolutely love them. That's, uh, that's one of the reasons that Darkwing is one of my favorite properties. It's the first Disney cartoon that really embraced the Looney Tunes style of humor. You know, an anvil falls on a character's head and then he, you know, accordions out of it. You know, there's, there's, uh, it's, it's interesting because I asked Tad when I started the book, I said, hey, how did you know on the show? You know, cause sometimes, you know, a huge thing will fall on Darkwing and, and he's fine. I said, but then, uh, you know, but then other times the threat is real. How did you balance that? And Tad said, if it happens before the commercial, it's a genuine threat. If it happens, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> I was like, oh, that's amazing. So, you know, uh, through, uh, throughout the issues, I, I tried to do the same thing where, you know, Darkwing will take a lot of damage. He gets a, a car thrown on him by the juggernaut and then, you know, like comes out of the glove box, you know, and, and is, uh, is fine. Uh, but, you know, if it's the end of the issue and, uh, you know, you're doing the cliffhanger and Megaduck's threatening him with a chainsaw, that chainsaw threat is real. 
<laughs> so uh, there you go. We've also got some. This kind of fo uh, follows up on that. This is from Fizz Chozo. Does can slapstick comedy work in comics? What do you, what do you think about that one, Mark? Um, so if the humor requires and um, kinetic energy, it's if it's something that was funny because you saw it in a car in a film or a TV show, if you saw it moving on the screen and it worked, that doesn't always translate to a comic because the comic is a static page. You can have a really good artist who is very good at simulating um, kinetic energy in their arts. Um, a lot of uh, manga artists are, are superb at that. Um, I've been following a Twitter account uh, that posts uh, Monkey Punch's art. And Monkey Punch, um, the creator of Lupin the Third, and he he adapted uh, the Mad Magazine style of art for manga, uh, which is why Lupin the Third is so unique. But it also means that his art has a whole lot of movement to it, and it's very fluid. Um, so he's very good at slapstick. Um, I think that if you want to study slapstick, that's um, a look at a lot of manga. Akira Toriyama has a lot of slapstick in um, in his uh, Dragon Ball comics, and that's because good at drawing fight scenes and simulating energy and movement. Um, and that translates really well to comedy. You'd be surprised. Um, if an artist is very good at drawing action, then it stands to reason they're also very good at drawing. Now, when it comes to that, though, I think that's also a question that's better suited to be answered by an artist than a writer. You can write slapstick into your, your comic. Um, just make sure that you have an artist who can pull it off. Um, and as for how they pull it off, well, You'll have to ask an artist. I, I'm not an artist. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, there's a, a, a bit in um, one of the Darkwing issues where uh, Darkwing confronts uh, an alternate universe Darkwing named Quiverwing Duck. And I wanted a fight scene between them, and I wanted it to be really slapsticky, but I didn't have an idea of what I wanted to do. So uh, I, I engaged in the uh, the age old uh, <laughs> the age old benefit of having a talented artist, which was I just said, hey, James, draw something funny. <laughs> and, uh, and he drew this whole sequence, this whole fight sequence with, uh, you know, the arrows and boomerang arrows and things like that, uh, that came around, you know, that he, he just absolutely sold. Like Darkwing gets pinned to the, uh, you know, he there's a couple arrows going to the wall, Darkwing springboards off of him, but then there's another one in his cape. So, you know, he gets uh, hamstrung and, you know, collapses onto the ground. But then the boomerang arrow that, uh, that Quiverwing fired first finally comes back around and ends up taking him out. Uh, so, you know, you get the bonus of all that slapstick comedy, but then also the gag of, uh, you know, the, the hero not really being effectual in taking the, in the actual taking down of the nemesis. So uh, we've got another one. This was from COVID, Kev. Are there any comedy books out right now and Dogman doesn't count? I would suggest if you don't mind satire in a comic that is going to push your buttons no matter who you are, they're going to do something that's going to maybe go too far for you. It's... Robert Kirkman's Die, 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 it is really over the top, but it is absolutely hilarious. If you can take a joke, like it is funny, but uh, man, do they, they go really far in that one, but it, it's good. Uh, Aaron Spur, do you have any, are there any comedy, comic books out right now that you would suggest? I, there's a lot of books that think that they're comedies, but uh, I don't think <laughs> that there's, uh, I don't think there's really, a, uh, there's kind of this attitude in the industry that humor doesn't sell. And uh, it's sort of true, but I think that it's because most of the time it is hard for people to write humor and they don't put, uh, they don't put the right people on the books. Um, you know, Deadpool had, is a character who has a lot of humor to him, but he's really become tired with uh, just kind of oversaturation and the amount of, uh, or, you know, just the level of talent that they've put on there. You know, just people that, that aren't naturally comedic. Uh, that are trying to force themselves to be comedic. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it, there's not a lot out there right now. Do you have any suggestions, uh, Mark? Well, so I haven't been reading very many comics that, that are strictly comedies. Um, there are some good comics that have humor in them, though. Um, I've been picking up, and well, I've been supporting uh, Doug Tenapol's Earthworm Jim, fulfilled like a month ago. And the books are funny. They're not necessarily comedies, though. And a lot of the humor just comes from the outrageous premise of it. I mean, it, it's a an earthworm in a robot suit uh, fighting an alien crow and, a, and characters with names like Professor Monkey for a head and Queen Slug for a butt. And just the humor a lot just comes from what the book is and, and the characters in it. 
um, even though it's not necessarily a comedy. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't really have any good recommendations for uh, purely comedic books that are on the shelves at the moment. Um, but there is a lot of good humor out there. Um, you just got to find it in the right places. Yeah, I would say, again, if you could seek out Sam and Max, uh, you know, that's uh, that's a great title. Uh, Evan Dorkin's done some some really funny stuff over the years, uh, Milk and Cheese and uh, and the, uh, the really obscure. Uh, it actually got an animated pilot at one point, but never went anywhere. Uh, I think it's called the Eltingville Collector's Society, which kind of pokes fun at, uh, you know, at, at nerds and uh, nerd fandom. And, you know, when you take it too far, long before that the term toxic fandom was uh, was fashionable, uh, you know, he actually wrote a really funny book about that. So um, and uh, actually, uh, I'm not I'm not uh, I can't recommend all of his work, especially, you know, some of the, the later stuff. But um, I did enjoy uh, Kevin Smith's uh, Clerks comics based off the animated series that they did. Uh, those were pretty fun. Oh, I haven't read like those in a long time. Movie. Yeah. Oh, um, but you. Uh, just popped into my head. So I think the funniest comics that I'm reading right now aren't even comics that are printed. It's web comics and yeah. they people who just post them on on Twitter. Uh, or there's um there's a website now called Webtoons um, that's basically a hosting platform for web comics and there's some on there that I follow. Uh, there's one that I really enjoy. It's called The Little Trash Maid and it's a pantomime comic and it's just about this mermaid who's living in a polluted ocean, but she doesn't know that it's polluted. She just thinks all the trash is just like fun stuff. And it's a pantomime comic of this mermaid just like playing with trash. And it's really funny. Um, Flork of Cows has the, those really crude looking sock puppet comics that he draws. And they're hilarious just because of the way he draws, the way the, um, they're, they're great reaction image fodder. Uh, those are really funny. I get a, a laugh out of those. There's um now this is more of a wholesome uh, family circus style thing, but uh, over on Twitter, uh, their handle is uh, at let me get it real quick at um, xpk, but their name is Diva, but their comic is called um, Little Nuns, and it's a pantomime comic, a one-panel comic of just these. Um, these young girls who are nuns who are living in a convent raising ducks and every drawing is just this wonderful it's, this, it's by a japanese artist but every drawing is just this wonderful um pic the nuns just living slice of life kind of with these ducks and, and doing fun things with them and so yeah there, there's a lot of um really good humor comics that i, I didn't even realize that i was consuming because it was free on the <laughs> but yes, there, there is a lot of good humor comics out there. I think just most of them are online. Yeah, there's one, uh, there's a strip uh, on uh, Instagram that I recommend called Mr. Lovenstein. Uh, and it's just, uh, it's uh, if you want something that's not entirely wholesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we got another question. This is from award winning editor Joe Corrala. He is saying to follow up on the comic relief characters. How do you prevent jokes revolving around fleshed out characters from turning them into unfunny two-dimensional characters? The example being Meg from Family Guy. Was Meg? No. Uh, um, yeah. I, what's what's the uh, trope phrase for that? Is it flanderizing? Uh, I think is the word for it. And that comes mm. from the fact that when Ned Flanders was first introduced on The Simpsons, he wasn't the Christian guy. Uh, he was just supposed to be like the anti-Homer, whereas Homer, Homer's family was always strapped for cash, uh, always had money to spare. Wherever Homer failed, Ned succeeded. Where, you know, Homer was fat and lazy, productive. And where Homer was a bad Christian, Ned was a good Christian. That was just one character. But then over the seasons, the writers thought the Christian thing was the funniest angle for Ned. And so that kind of just became it. Ned just became the Christian guy to make Christian jokes about. And that was it. And so that's why the term flanderizing exists. And it can be a, a, a difficult trap to um, avoid. Because if you find that uh, one aspect of your character lands harder than the other aspects, then of course your natural inc inclination as a writer is to focus on that one thing. Um, but like, uh, even as, as the question pointed out, you know, end up taking a character who was previously three dimensional and turning them into a one note um, gag, and then the character's not popular anymore. Um, you just have to be self aware of it. Um, you have to avoid the temptation to have this one character do this one thing all the time. Um, you can have them do that thing. Just have them do other things. 
Yeah, and try not to try not to center your joke in in things like oh the character's nationality or, or country of origin mm-hmm. or or race or belief system. You know, it, it, try to develop fully fleshed out three-dimensional characters that have many facets to them uh you know too too often you get hung up in just in just one thing and, and you end up with characters that are just cardboard cutouts and that that becomes not interesting for for your uh, your viewer or your reader you know um apu on the simpsons you know got a lot of uh trash thrown at him for being like oh the entire joke with apu is that he's the indian guy and i disagree with that and the entire uh, the problem with apu thing i really just totally disagree with but you know i didn't get to have a have a say on that but i never saw apu as being the indian guy um i saw him as being the quickie one of the jokes with apu had nothing to do with his accent or his nationality um there were episodes about that sometimes but most of the jokes were just situational for his job at the Quickie Mart, him getting robbed, him uh, having to deal with shoplifters, him selling spoiled meat to Homer and putting him in the hospital, things like that. Um, most of, of uh, Apu's jokes came from that thing was actually just something they only brought up whenever it was convenient, uh, like his uh, arranged marriage with Manjula. The um being an illegal alien and having to get a citizenship like you can only think of like two t- thing was actually relevant to the character um so apu is almost like the opposite of a flanderization he's someone who uh people misremember or misinterpret as being flanderized when in reality apu actually has a whole lot of other stuff going on um and he's he is a more well you know he also has so many uh so many endearing traits to him uh, you know, he, he is somebody who's a hard worker. He's a character who uh, is very cheerful for the most part. Even when Homer gets on his nerves, there's, there's you know, a bit where he'll say, like, you know, Mr. Simpson, you know, get out of my store and come again. You know, like, <laughs> just very, like, my favorite Apu joke is uh, where the uh, the guys bring him, uh, bring him the ice, the bags of ice for his, uh, you know, <laughs> for his business and uh the guy says you've got to stop start charging more than 99 cents with these bags of ice i lost three men on that expedition and if says well if you come up with a better way to make ice you let me know it's not a joke about about his nationality or about him being indian it's, it's a you know it's a joke about being the guy at the quickie mart you're absolutely right <laughs> mm-hmm. so we do have another question this is from johan uh, karlstrom I'm sorry, I'm not even going to try that last name. It looks complicated. Is there a kind of plot, there, are there kinds of plots that are more or less suited for comedy? I mean, a good humorist can find the humor in anything. Um, I, I think that if you've, got, uh, if you've got the right satirical mindset, you know, and, and you kind of view, uh, I, I, people who take themselves very seriously, in my opinion, are not good at comedy. People who are sort of self-deprecating and, and kind of think that, you know, there's there's humor to be found in everything and, and isn't the human condition ridiculous uh, can find humor in, in pretty much any situation. So I, I think that, uh, you know, I think that, yeah, there's probably certain situations that are more suited towards comedy, you know, misunderstandings. There's there's a lot of uh, mileage that you can get out of that. You know, I mean, hell, Three's Company got how many seasons out of uh, <laughs> you know, every episode? Uh, my favorite episode of uh, Three's Company is the one that's all just based on a big misunderstanding. <laughs> just, like, uh, just like my favorite Gilligan's Island is where they almost get off the island, but then they don't. Oh, I love that one. Oh. Yeah. No, I mean, if, if you can take something like uh, Hogan's Heroes, which is <laughs> a bunch of people at a POW camp and turn that into a comedy setting for a sitcom, anything goes. Um, I don't think that there's any situational premise that uh, can't be used for comedy, that, that can't be turned into a comedy. It's just at the end of the day, you have to be funny. That's that's really uh, the, the big clincher right there is like, are you can turn anything into a comedy. Are you not funny? Well, then um, go right on action. All right, so AL has a question. Have you ever seen the Chinese comic Old Master Q? I find there there's a lot of humor that includes slapstick and non-sequitur humor. Have either of you seen that one? I haven't. Uh, no, but I can check it out. Yeah, I have not. All right, well, that one's going on the list. Sounds <laughs> like it might be worth checking out. So thank you for the recommendation, AL. Sorry we weren't able to, to uh, talk about that one. I think we've got the last question. I, I think you guys kind of answered this one, so we'll answer it real quick again. This is from Dion. How do you prevent flannerization of comic relief characters or characters in general who are layered and three-dimensional? How do you prevent that one, Aaron? 
I think that you just have to care about your work and you have to care about the characters. Don't don't take the easy way out. Don't be a lazy writer. Uh, you know, it becomes really easy to just kind of like lean into the one thing uh, about a character. But, you know, you want to make sure that they, they always have their own point of view and their own uh, their own personality, their own goals and, and, and dreams. That's the way to think about your characters is think about them as individual people. What motivates them? What is it that they're that they're seeking? What is it that they're after? You know, is it love? Is it money? Is it uh, you know, is it fame? Is it acceptance? You know, if you if you keep those things in mind, then I think that you'll also be able to write good jokes for that character that come out of those motivations. But you'll also be able to keep them three dimensional and real to people. All right, Mark. Hmm? Do you have an answer to that one? Uh, no, because um, I mean, I basically uh, I agree with Aaron, uh, but also I think we already kind of tackled that question. Yeah. All right, well, this will that'll basically wrap us up on this uh, edition of Comic Book Writing 101, talking about incorporating humor into your comic book, talk about kind of the types of humor, some of the benefits of humor, some of the pitfalls, some tips, and then we went through some anecdotes and some stories about how Mark and Aaron have incorporated, and we did viewer questions. Aaron, thank you so much for joining us. Do you have anything else to say before we, we head down? Uh, just, uh, I'm just going to throw in a quick plug here. Uh, I'm doing a uh, Tuesday night show with Jesse Snyder and Tori Mel. Uh, you know, it's called Coolest Alive, where we just uh, talk about the latest things in uh, in the world of uh, geek culture. So if you get a chance, please, uh, you know, please check me out on Instagram, Twitter, uh, and uh, follow along, you know, because I'll, I'll make announcements as we're about to go live. And that's on Twitch, correct? Yeah, it's on Twitch. Uh, it's also on YouTube on Jesse Snyder's channel. So if you just okay. look him up, uh, you, can, uh, you can follow and check it out. There you go. Also, Mark, do you have anything else to say? Speak now or forever hold your peace, my friend. <laughs> well, as long as we're shilling, then yes, I do. Um, uh, Black Ops X Common America is going to go live for pre-order on Kickstarter May 5th, so uh, like a week and a half from now. Uh, there's already a uh, an announcement page on Kickstarter where you can sign up uh, to receive an email notification when it goes live. Um, and uh, just look up uh, Black Ops X Common America and you'll find it. And yeah, so that's going up on May 5th, and we're going to have some exclusive and limited tiers. So again, uh, if there's something that you don't want to miss out on, just uh, go ahead and sign up to be notified by Kickstarter. Uh, that way you can uh, be there bright and early on May 5th when it goes live, and you can uh, snipe some of those things before they sell out. And shut All up right, and Mark. take my money. <laughs> last question. How well did, did, did Common America, the last volume, do? What did you end up doing between Kickstarter and Indiegogo? Well, uh, combined, Common America 3 made 122000 um, so it was our most successful uh, campaign yet, and we're very grateful to everybody who supported it, um, the people who uh, who picked up a copy, but also the people who um, who shared it and uh, uh, promoted it. Uh, we're very, very grateful, and we've got so much more coming. I just got mine the other day. It, it looks fantastic. I haven't, I haven't sat down and actually read it yet, but uh, I flipped through it, and it just looks gorgeous. Congratulations your, your word to balloons. you, Tim. That's awesome. Your word balloons look gorgeous. <laughs> awesome. That's the hardest part, the word balloon. <laughs> All right, fellas. We'll see you later, and we will be back here live next weekend uh, to talk about another subject. Not sure what it is yet. We haven't we haven't uh, hammered that out, but we will be talking about writing comic books right here next weekend. Oh, we've got a, a super chat from Albino Thunderbuns, the best handle in YouTube, period. You're not going to beat that one. Uh, $5. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. Great conversation. I'd listen to a series of episodes about humor and storytelling in general and in comics specifically. Well, if you have, if this is your first time catching one of these, I believe this is the seventh lesson. So there are six episodes prior to this, but they're not all about humor. It's it's about uh, you know some of the basics for, for for getting ready for your comic book story, and then about developing heroes, villains, and this is the first one we've done where it's like incorporating elements into the story. We'll obviously be talking about tension and some other things like that. The other six are all very serious. Some would even say morose. <laughs> They're grim. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody. And, and sorry, Matthew, you just got in here. Uh, definitely go back and, and uh, watch the replay. And we'll see you next weekend. Hopefully you make it on time. See ya.